Okay, we're recording. Okay, so welcome everyone to the April meeting of the Transportation and Street Permits Committee. I'm your co chair, Jess Coleman. Our esteemed chair, Betty Kay, is joining us online. Um, and of course, our district manager, Zach Flower. Um, we have a packed agenda as always. So let's get started. We're starting with a presentation from EDC on the Blue Highways Initiative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's pull up our slides. Let's get right to it. Do we interpret for where we? Uh, no, just make sure your these are over here. Take right. your yeah, you can sit at the table. Yes, but sit sit the table. Yeah. I told them not to earlier. Now I feel really thought about it. <laughs> Stay Stay recording that. That's right. <laughs> My voice is <laughs> um, great. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. My name is Tara Das. I'm with EDC's government and community relations team. I work with our transportation portfolio. So that's blue highways, what we're here tonight to talk about, and all of our freight initiatives, um, also ferries, helicopters, cruise terminals. Um, so you may be hearing and seeing me in different capacities. Um, I'm also joined by Gustavo Moran, who's from our transportation department as well, and um, is really in the weeds on a lot of our blue highway stuff. Um, I'll jump to the next slide and get right into it. Um, so a quick overview of what blue highways are. So this is a joint initiative between EDC and DOT to encourage the use of New York City's waterways to move goods. Um, and Lou, or in addition to the traditional methods that are already in place. So I'm sure I don't have to tell you all that um, we are seeing massive rises in, in dependence on truck-related freight movement um, with e-commerce trends rising uh, and people just generally relying on a lot of last mile delivery. We're seeing a lot more truck traffic in the city. Um, obviously, congestion pricing is dealing with some of that, but we also want to be leveraging our other methods to move goods. So using our waterways is one of the more traditional ways that we've always had in the city, and we're kind of going back to that and building out that infrastructure to, um, to support the movement of goods. It's generally a more sustainable option as well. It uses a lot, um, you know, the emissions related to this activity are significantly lower when it's moving by water. Um, but to do this, we need to expand our access to waterfront and make sure that the infrastructure to support this is updated and in place to um, really be able to be used um, at a more at a greater scale. So EDC and DOT have been in the process of exploring what this looks like. Um, you may be familiar with some of the plans like Freight NYC delivering green that have been released over the past few years to set out lay out our priorities around how to move goods by water, by rail, by micro freight, and um, generally sustainable alternatives to this. Um, so a huge part of that is making sure that we have our waterways leveraged to be able to establish um, that second and second to last mile and last mile uh, portion of, of the movement delivery network. Uh, next slide. So again, as you all know this already, I'm sure that NYC has a growing dependence on trucks overall. 90% of goods are trucked into NYC, into the city, and 120,000 trucks are moving through the city's highway network daily. Um, so obviously this is a huge issue that we need to be addressing in, um, as soon as possible to address climate change um, and address related street safety issues related to this. Um, Obviously, truck traffic negatively impacts neighborhoods, not just from that safety and environmental, but also from the wear and tear it has on our infrastructure. So being able to move that across different methods is really key to the to our goals. So, next slide. Um, so in terms of blue highway and how they've come to be over the past few years and where we're at right now. In 2018, I mentioned the release of the, the Freight NYC plan that really laid out where the city is um, targeting our efforts in making sure that we are uh, addressing a lot of the issues that I've laid out. More recently, in 2022, we received $5.1 million from the Merit Federal Grant Program to build out maritime infrastructure at six sites. Um, I'll go over those six sites a little bit more soon, um, but just in terms of what's happened since then, from getting that grant funding to now, we've been in the process of doing an environmental assessment of the different sites, 
Um, and that has also allowed us to require freight and maritime freight at, um, at the downtown Manhattan Hellport site, which is one of those locations. Um, I'm sure most of this group is already aware. We are in the process of preparing for the heliport. So that process is underway, but because of the merit grant funds, we were able to make maritime freight a requirement at this site. Um, so we're in the process of reviewing all those responses right now, but um, we're excited that we're going to be able to use the heliport site for more than just helicopters. Um, since then, we also released a blue highway RFEI with GOG. Um, an RFEI, different from an RFP, is mostly just to get ideas and information from the industry. Um, this allowed us to get uh, a better understanding of what the industry challenges are, where there is interest in blue highways or in type of infrastructure and locations to build out blue highway further. Um, but specifically related to the merit grant, uh, earlier last month we released the RFP for a design and engineering consultant. Um, that RFP is still where it's closed. Yes, it's closed now, and so we're reviewing responses. Um, but once we have a, a respondent, or once we have a design and engineering consultant in place, we'll be able to move on to the next stage, which will be building out um, the design, doing the environmental review process, um, and reengage and engage with stakeholders as a part of that as well. Um, parallel to this, I mean, obviously this is all blue highway stuff, but there are significant micro freight initiatives that DOT is um, working on that will ultimately be connected to a lot of this work. Um, to provide just a brief overview of what that is, they did run a micro hub pilot that's to look at different locations for micro distribution centers and are building out some, or in the process of identifying um, locations for micro hubs. Um, they also just recently, uh, a couple of days ago, announced new rules that will allow e-cargo bikes to function as a delivery option on our streets. Um, so obviously they're not here tonight, but just wanted to highlight some of those initiatives that obviously will be corresponding a lot with our Blue Highway work as well. Next slide. Um, so a little bit more about the Marin Marine Highway Grant. Uh, this is run by the U.S. Marine Highway Program, which um, has the purpose of utilizing and leveraging our waterways to reduce congestion, emissions, and improve supply chains. Um, the purpose of this grant is to fund projects like this one uh, to facilitate the waterborne freight and micro distribution methods um, at marine facilities. So um, the primary focus of this type of thing is not to be, you know, building massive warehouses on uh, the waterfront by any means, but rather to use blue, uh, to use barges to transfer goods that would then go on to some sort of cargo bike. Uh, one of them is pictured in the right here um, that would then do that last mile delivery portion. Next slide. Um, so a little bit more about this project. Again, as I mentioned, there are six waterfront landing sites throughout. The idea here is that we would be building out um, the pier so that the barge could hook up to it. On the right is kind of like an aerial uh, shot of what that could look like. And then obviously a barge would tie up and then transfer the, the goods from the barge onto something, you know, some type of micro freight distribution. Um, so these sites um, that were selected have known interest by the freight industry and maritime operators. Um, these sites are also all within EDC's Dock NYC program. Um, for those who don't know, the Dock NYC program is the city's kind of one-stop shop for managing birthing space that appears throughout the city. And so these sites were, you know, had fewer bar barriers to being built out for maritime freight. Um, and generally, you know, we've been able to pilot a little bit of what that kind of transfer would look like. And our understanding is that these, these six sites, um, you know, are well positioned to, to really be uh, unloading a lot of the burden that is being caused by, by trucks and, and moving that in a, an alternative way. Next slide. So this is a, a, a map of the different sites um, for Newbor one, obviously the downtown Manhattan heliport Pier 6 site is where we're at. We have two other sites in Manhattan, uh, two sites in Sunset Park, and one site in the Bronx there as well. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, uh, we're in the process of reviewing responses to the RFP. 
once we uh, select design and engineering consultant, we'll have a little bit more knowledge about the immediate or, you know, more concrete information to share with you all about the next steps in the analysis process, engagement process, but we anticipate being able to come back at the end of the year um, to share more about the details of the site locations, planned infrastructure upgrades, um, and anything else that comes out from, from this, this whole process. Um, ultimately, the goal is to start construction on these sites at the end of 2025. And that's it from us. Yeah, um, so in, in this RFP, uh, will, will um, comfort facilities be considered for the drivers, meaning the people that uh, deliver Ristas? They're going to need comfort facilities, and th this would be an ideal place to have it for them? I believe the main priority is just the peer upgrades. It's not additional infrastructure beyond that. Um, we would have, you know, have to take that back as well, just to see what other opportunities there would be for for something like that. But obviously, uh, we're, for now at least, that grant money is specifically for and this, the study is specifically for just the the barge tie up here. I would think Port of Sand, just like in construction sites, would be a simple stopgap solution until something else it, it is or is not done. But that seems to be a no brainer. You can maybe bring that back, you know. Yep. And that's that's cool. We care a lot about that. I'm sorry. Okay. I got one question about like this is like, so exciting sounding that um, as far as the cargo bikes and building out bike lane infrastructure that feeds into these distribution centers because one thing that has you know my fear as a cyclist is that bike lanes are pretty narrow as it is mm -hmm. and these things are pretty wide they tend to be mm -hmm. and so um, is there some thought going into whether or not you know um, bike lane infrastructure will be more robust mm -hmm. in, in these areas because it, it sounds like that's the, the goal is to, like you said, to decrease truck traffic and that sort yeah. of thing. So, you know, you're going to need like space to work on to deliver the bag. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, definitely. It's a great question. And I mean, as we mentioned, only just recently were these types of cargo bikes even fully regulated to be on the roads in general. Obviously, thinking through how that would um, be integrated with the bike lane network, I think is something that's being considered, but um, definitely more of DOT's domain. Um, and, you know, that's something I think they're actually. And there are some, some streets like Reef Street where it would be impossible to expand the bike lane because it's already thin, it's already enough. But so maybe on like the streets where, like wider streets, like part, like say Park Row or yeah. streets, or like on you know on Avenue because there are some streets where I'm not 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 saying for or against it, but it, it, there would be a danger on both ways if because of of uh, still vans and trucks still have to you know deliver. Is this Amazon? Is Amazon part of uh, delivery with the the, the marine uh, delivery, or are they just? So these sites um, are purely just within the dock and might see like they're they're city owned sites. No, um, is, is Amazon one of the companies that? Like say would take advantage, like would would take because they're all trucks now. So would that be something because they're like the main delivery, like for goods and services. So is that something that would take, like a uh, be part of so that it would take away some of the trucks from the areas? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this the idea of this is that it would be used by by all players cool. in the freight industry. Um, Amazon is definitely testing and piloting out their own types of initiatives. They have their Rivian program. I was not here to speak through about their projects, no. but. Um, but they're definitely exploring this as well, and so yeah, the the ideal is that all of these players are using. Um, thank you. Um, I work for half a, half a second with lumpers, um, which is like the warehouses where trucks come and deposit their goods, and then another truck will come and pick them up um, to keep track of the supply chain. Essentially, they would have to align with a certain. Uh, with the methods and very fascinating stuff. Uh, would that occur in this situation, like on the barge where they're sorting, or um, how is that managed? I that assume, extent? and I definitely want to come back with a more confirmed point on this, but I assume that probably wouldn't be happening at this scale in Manhattan just because of the type of freight network we have here. Um, the location in the Bronx is definitely closer to 
Hans point and, and the greater, you know, freight movement that's happening up there. So potentially it could be, you know, related to that site. Um, Sunset Park also, those two sites are relatively close to a lot of, you know, the larger centers around South Brooklyn too. Um, so I have to come back to you with the specifics on that, but um, that would probably be something that would be more, you know, related to those those sites, larger spaces. Yeah. Yeah. This, this may be the same question. And apologies if I'm misunderstanding something, but if we're trying to get trucks off the roads, so we're trying to replace trucks with these waterways, where are the goods being transferred from the trucks onto these? Waterways. Like, where's that happening? It's related. So I think like a, an example which we piloted um, was it last year at Pier 17 was moving um, Manhattan beers goods from the Bronx to Lower Manhattan. If you think about you know a restaurant or a bar that would probably need beer, alcohol, whatever delivered from a major distribution site. So the truck would come from let's say it's coming from upstate New York, go to Hunts Point. That then it would transfer onto a marine barge, move its way down to Lower Manhattan, move on to a cargo bike, and then get delivered. I mean, as an example, but yeah. that's sort of the type of thing. Yeah. So those sites that you showed us are are also going to serve as places where this stuff is put onto the. It's not just where they're let off because, I mean, the ones in Manhattan, for example, you you don't want trucks coming into Manhattan and then loading them onto the the waterways there because that would be the purpose, right? So it's only. The sites that I mean, so you're saying in terms of like where the freight is moving, is it just coming in? Yeah, is it also moving it out? Yeah. um, I mean, I think a lot of that will kind of be in terms of like where that freight movement is happening will be determined once these are built in the first place. But I think like what we're seeing, you know, like if, if you think about what movement that's already happening now, is pretty much just like anything that's like getting on a truck in one direction is gonna be going on water, and so if it's like you know. I think most of the freight movement that we're seeing that would probably is more coming into Manhattan than it is going out. We're not seeing large amounts of distribution coming out of Manhattan as much as we are seeing coming in. Um, I think that's the best of a description I can give right now, just because we're so early in this process that we don't have as much um, specifics around the levels of, of freight that we'll be moving in this yeah. just today. Let's do Eric first. Um, I foresee that that they're going to want to have to pick up cargo. It's not going to just be one way, because if you're going to bring a barge with goods, commodities for people, you know, yeah. let's say Amazon users, they're going to come off, but you're going to have an empty vessel. There would be a need. I mean, you already have to ship there, you know, before it goes back to, let's say, the Bronx or that example you had. It doesn't want to travel empty. It's already a fixed cost. So I, I do anticipate some some return travel, you know, some some goods coming back. And then also there will be some need for some warehousing there. Not everything's going to be able to be delivered, you know, exactly and precise some waiting time for the bar. Let's say it's every 5 hours. I'm just throwing that out. There will be some time where where goods will need to be stored. So please consider that in the RFP that you will need some 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 storage area. Also, as we were talking about last month, um, maybe some E some was it? The charging facility, something, right? Yeah, the new charging facility for, for the cyclists. I mean, for the delivery. Yeah. Facilities. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and then I, I'm also worried that if this is going to be a main point where uh, deliveristas and their large cargo bikes are coming, it, it will be treacherous for pedestrians and other cyclists. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's and just to, to confirm for sure, though, that like this, it will it will exclusively be e-bikes or delivering the I mean the, from um goods from these these sites. It's not there will be no trucks. Not necessarily. I mean, again, I think a lot of this will be clarified later down the line. Right, right now, we're at the very early stages of okay. this, so it's kind of very conceptual right now. But depending on again the type of movement going through. If it's not e bikes, it could be something like a you know, uh, an electric delivery van. Again, I, we don't know just yet what types of transportation are going to be traveling where, um, but it's not just exclusively e bikes. I think that's one of the things that are, you know, new and exciting, but obviously at some point there may be a need for more freight volumes. And so it would be something like a delivery van. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, I um another part of my question from earlier is that like the, the looping warehouses were created to prevent theft effectively, like mm -hmm. with the you know the, the railway theft at the time, um uh, hundred years ago. But the the Amazon trucks and some of the other like FedEx trucks, et cetera, have been uh, there's a New York Times article recently about how they're being um you know they're targeted for theft. Uh, what would there be a level of security here? Because a lot of the time, like the trucks feel safe because you can lock them when you leave. Mm -hmm. Smaller vehicles might be easier to break into or just steal and then break into later. So anyway, yeah, just considering. Yeah, I know that's a really great point. Um, I think at this point, we're not considering it just yet. Doesn't mean that we won't be at all. It's it's an, a very important part, and obviously safety is a huge priority for all of our um our operations but just at this time we don't have a specific plan just yet so we're still reviewing responses and obviously have a lot more room to go on on this so not just yet but i love it i think it's really exciting i think there's a lot of safety things involved with people like larger vehicles that could be heavier but that's a dot daddy you uh want to jump in uh yes thank you Yes, no, Tara, this does sound very exciting, so thank you for presenting. I'm going to try to avoid any DOT sort of question, and I realize it's very early. But in general, when picking the three piers that are going to be used in Manha on the west side of on the east side of Manhattan, was there any discussion about the geographic area of Manhattan that they would serve? Can I ask that most specifically because I noticed that the district for CB3, which is just north of us, does not have uh, any of these locations to receive any of the vessels, any of the ferries. So I kind of think of would it be likely that the deliveries to Pier 6 are meant for not only our district, but the one north of us? Yeah, I. I... Again, can't speak to that just yet in terms of where the exact, um, you know, the radius of, of where these deliveries will happen just yet, I think. But there definitely is thought to where I, I don't assume that, you know, CB3 would be completely cut out of benefiting from this because of the, because of the location of um, um, so, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, these locations are not uh, restrictive in terms of its geographical, um, you know, geographical reach. Uh, but again, I think a lot of that will will be clarified later down the line. Thank you. Um, so the airport in New Jersey has they. We were approached about some sort of ferry to the airport. Do you remember that? Yes. Sure. Um, I feel like it would be interesting to see one of these routes go to the airport. Seems like that would be a great place to sort packages and then send them our way. Mm. Can't get all the way to the airport. Remember, it was like two at one point, right. and then there was like a train or something. Well, I mean, the airport's also got a lot of other stuff going on, but yeah, it'd yeah. be kind of cool to, to figure out a way to get to from Jersey. Just a thought. And there's plenty of freight areas by the by New York airport. So however the tracks get there, so this one would just get there and then they would be picked up there. There's not really street traffic around there. So another truck could pick up the truck from the waterway at the you know at the border instead of having to take the air train. But anyway. And and smash. Exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. One clarification. So to land it any of these landing sites uh, boat would come from anywhere. It doesn't have to come from another one of these landing sites, right? Like it could, it could come from elsewhere. Yeah. New Jersey or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And what percentage, like if you were to calculate or if you were to like set a goal for success, like what do you see a percentage of uh, freight traffic or freight goods and volume that this would displace from the road. I mean, yeah, we don't have specifics on that just yet. Um, I, the RFI that we uh, work with DOT on releasing, I think, will help 
get a give us a lot more understanding of just where we're here in the industry of what will be moving on to Blue Highway, for example. Um, but at this time, we don't have specific data on that just yet. Do you have a sense of like what volume it could handle? Okay, sorry. <laughs> no. Do you have a sense of what volume is already like happening in, in Lower Manhattan? At the scale that we're that would that this would be supporting, I want to say zero, right? I mean it's or very little. No, no, no. Uh, like uh, truck traffic. Probably. Oh, truck traffic? Yeah. No. No. So it's early stages. Are you planning to um, like uh, work with shipping logistics companies? It's like maybe you're saying it's like an extraordinarily complex situation. Yeah. So is that part I of assume the they would respond, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean yeah. That, that's definitely one of the, the targeted industries that, that is part of this. And um, while I can't speak to who responded to the RFBI, that's obviously one of the many players we wanted to hear. Eric? Yep. Um, so when this, pardon if I'm not even the right term, RFP, do you specify on what the capacity of the ships should be? Like, like how much volume or is it, a, is it, is it weight that that's a limiting factor? The, the RFP, which is just for the six sites, is just for a design and engineering consultant. So that's just somebody who's doing the technical analysis of like how to build out this kind of pier that will hook up to barges and, and move goods. So it's not as much you know, sizing up the, the movement of goods, but rather doing it enough, you know, developing the plans for building this out in the first place. Obviously that will be a part of it, um, but it, the, our, the consultant is more like an engineering design. But the RFBI is, that means request for information. That is who we would be wanting, that is the vehicle that we use to hear from all the stream from speed. Okay. That explains the distinction a bit. Maybe, maybe, because okay. I'm thinking, that if this RFEI, there has to be some specifications on what the pier, you know, the loads for the pier and, and what type of ships or, you know, how large the moorings would be or how deep they are, but that would be determined later. So that, that will be determined by the engineering and design consultant that's brought on to the RFP. I know there's okay. a lot of technical uh, acronyms here, but okay. yes. Um, yeah. Anything else? Betty, anything else? Can we have them come back when they have more? Is yeah, we definitely want to come back. Um, I think I mentioned the timeline, like end of the year, when, when we have more about you know the, the, the what the consultant has been working on, what their findings are, um, and what the plan is. And is Kate on the line? Uh, yes, she should. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just sounds like it was good joint effort. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm excited to see what you guys come up with. This is really cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Cool. Thank you very thank you. much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Um, Betty, are the Dwayne Park slides on your uh, your slides or? Yes, they, yeah, no, you have to start the slides and mm -hmm. people see the agenda and then. So the second and third uh, are the slides are already integrated. Yeah, Blue Highway, thank you again. Um, so now, request for a street permit for the dinner on Duane. Any of you probably remember we've done before. Um, is our presenter from Friends of Dwayne Park here? Yes. Online. So whenever you are ready, unmute yourself. Thanks for watching. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Nice to see you. My name is Bettina Teodoro, and I'm a board member of the Friends of Duane Park and the chair of Dinner on Duane, which is now entering its third year. 
I'm here today to thank CB1 for your past support of our event and to ask once again for a resolution in support of our application for a permit to close Duane Street between Greenwich and Hudson Streets on September 15, 2024. Um, may I please have the first slide? So this is just a, this, this is the homepage of our website at, at DuanePark.org just to tell you a little bit about um, our organization. We are all volunteer organization. We help maintain Duane Park as well as Tribeca Park further north on Beach Street. Um, in addition to park maintenance, we also organize multiple events around the year to bring the community together around Duane Park. We host about 10 events annually, all of which are open and free to the public. Coming up this spring, um, we have paper shredding day in April to give you an example, spring planting for children on Mother's Day. And this summer, we will have five live concerts in the park from May to September. The first one is on May 9th. And you can see a listing of all our events on our website at duanepark.org. And again, all are welcome. Next slide, please. This slide gives you a little snapshot of the park's long history and special designation as the city's first public parkland. The park was created in 1797. Hence, in uh, 2002, we celebrated the park's 225th anniversary and the first dinner on Duane. Next slide, please. Our milestone dinner was very successful, so we did it again last year. And last year, tickets to the public sold out in less than an hour. Last year's dinner was also great. Um, and since then, we have received many inquiries about a third dinner. So here we are. Next slide, please. So like the last two years, our mission for this event is to bring together the community in a very unique setting and at the same time to engage them on the mission of Friends of Duane Park and also on the restoration and resiliency project that we're working on. And of course, it is also a fundraiser for our project as well as all our regular Friends of Duane Park programming throughout the year. Next slide, please. So this year, the event will be on Sunday, September 15. The format is unchanged from previous years. There's an afternoon for the community that's open to all, followed by the ticketed standing reception and seated dinner. We're still working with local businesses, um, including the ones you see here, uh, Dwayne Park Patisserie, Tribeca Wine Merchants, Laughing Man, Elon Flowers, and this year's restaurant partner, which is Artisano, a, a relatively new Peruvian restaurant on Chambers Street. So um, well, these are all great partners for us, um, and we're working with them and hope to work with them this year. Next slide, please. In addition, we're very grateful. We have um, our lead sponsors for the third year consecutive year. Um, great support for us. Um, Amy Bergna, Bergman Bonamy of Compass is our presenting partner. She's a real estate agent and a resident of the neighborhood. American Express, which has a, histo a history in the neighborhood, and also 60 Hudson, which is the Western Union building. Um, which last year also was, um, we had to uh, pivot and move our event indoors um, at the last minute because of rain and they graciously provided us with an indoor space to host our event. Next slide, please. So, uh, so this is the more details about our program on the 15th. Starting at noon, we'll have some live music with small ampl amplification within the park throughout the afternoon, as well as lemonade and cookies for children. And we'll also be doing um, you know, public engagement on the restoration project. We'll have an information table, renderings, designs, and also a uh, temporary asphalt treatment to show the, the extended footprint of the park so that people can see how it will look like. And then at four, we have the uh, cocktail reception followed by the dinner. Next slide, please. Our SAPO application, which was, we filed it last year, and then when we had to, we weren't able, we didn't need the permit because we went indoors, so we changed the date. So um, nothing has changed. We are requesting street closure of both sides of Duane from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on the 15th. Sidewalks will remain open to the public. We have a few tents for the kitchen operations and check-in, some amplified sound and a generator. We have very good relationships with all the neighbors on the block, residential and commercial, and have received no objections to any aspect of our event. Next slide, please. And this is our site plan. It remains unchanged from last year. I did send a larger one if you, in case the thumbnail is too small and you'd like to see it later on in, in its entirety. 
but this shows um, just the general plan of the street from of Duane Street between Greenwich and Hudson. Next slide, please. And this is just an overview of the permitting timeline. We filed already the SAPO application in last March. The other permits will be filed later this summer. The SLA one day permit, our sound permit, our generator permit. Tickets will go on sale June 1. They are $500 per person, and the proceeds go to Friends of Duane Park. This is our contact information. And um, so this concludes the slide presentation. Um, thank you for listening, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I know Betty has her hand up, right? Thank you. This is just to clarify a point, and I think actually your photograph on one of your slides did. You did not mention, as in last year, closing off Staple Street so they cannot enter your seat where you're going to be holding your dinner, but you're also going to be asking to close off Staple Street, Staple Street from Duane Street, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um... Yes, I believe that's correct. I will confirm that and, and come back to you if that's if that's incorrect. But yes, we do close stable. It's a safety measure as well. Thanks so much and have a great dinner. Thank you, Betty. Eric, um, with 175 to 200 people uh, there, will you have security? We do. Uh, we ha uh, we ask the. Um, uh, F uh, NYPD, um, they always send a few officers. Um, they put up barricades, they sent a few officers down to the site and they spent the evening with us. Thank you. It's a very low maintenance, uh, non confrontational event. Yeah. I've seen it many years. Okay. okay. It's a good one. It's so cute. I haven't participated, but I've, I've passed by it. It's a family thing. Uh, one question You said there's a, a free community. Part to it. Can you just uh, describe what that is a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So starting at noon, um, setup will be going on um, on the street. But at noon, inside Dwayne Park itself, we'll have uh, live music. We'll have uh, lemonade and cookies. We usually also have some craft tables, and then we also have you know um, members of Friends of Dwayne Park, the Restoration Committee. Uh, we'll set up a table there and. Uh, talk to the public about the plans for the restoration, ask for feedback, welcome ideas, um, show them what, you know, what it will look like. And then, you know, four o'clock, uh, uh, people are welcome to stay and enjoy the cocktail party. We just can only serve liquor to those who have, um, will have a designated bracelet. Thanks. Yeah. So does that mean you all landed on the expansion? Uh, that I know you are talking about a couple of months ago. No, that's still that's still in the works. Um, uh, it's still there. Uh, the restoration committee team is still working with Department of Transportation on that. Anything else? If not. Okay, resolution. Will be resolved. Three board one urges the street activity permit office to approve the Friends of Dwayne Park Street activity permit application to close Dwayne Street between Hudson and Greenwich Street and to stop traffic from Stable Street from entering Dwayne Street for a one day celebration on September 15, 2024. Questions? We'll take a motion. Second. Well, I think you have to make the yeah. motion to oh. do the thing. <laughs> Second. All right. <laughs> um, we'll do it by affirmation. No room. Any opposed? Eagles? Any abstentions? And then we'll do Betty online. Betty, how do you vote? <laughs> yes. Okay. Motion has it. No, okay, that's right. I'll just close this way a little bit. Oops. We're just going to have a kid to Yeah. Give us a moment while we. Okay, well, thank you, Bettina. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much.
Back to our slides. Moving right along, folks. Okay, for this third one, which is a uh, request for a hotel loading zone in front of the Warren Street Hotel, um, I will hand it over to Betty. Actually, this can be turned over to the, pre the presenters about their applicant, about their request. Okay, great. Isn't it here? Good evening. I believe we have our attorney Frank and Lena here as well. I think he just wanted to introduce himself. Um, and then I sent over the presentation to Mr. Bomber. So I was hoping to run through that. Okay. Great. This, this is Frank Angelino. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as I said, Frank Angelino, I represent the Warren Street Hotel, which is newly opened in February on Warren Street, uh, 11 stories, a boutique hotel, 69 rooms plus supportive services. The application before you is a referral from the borough commissioner of the Department of Transportation for a loading zone in front of the um, Warren Street Hotel to have a hotel loading zone in order to reduce congestion on the street and to facilitate loading and unloading uh, briefly for the hotel. Um, the as you just heard, uh, Paul Hamby is the general manager of the hotel and will make the presentation along with uh, Paul Underhill, who is one of the representatives of the ownership of the hotel. Um, and that's basically the application because we are less than 100 rooms and the DOT, which has jurisdiction over um, hotel loading zones, of greater than 100 rooms refers the matter when it's less than 100 rooms to the local community board for their advisory recommendation. And with that, I turn it over to uh, Nick Hamby. Hello, this is Paul Underhill. I'm responsible for the Ferndale development in New York City and have had the opportunity of working in the past for the Crosby Street Hotel and also the Whitby Hotel. And one of the important things we found is the requirement to work very closely with the community. And I believe that you'll find that we have a group here that is going to work very closely with you. Nick Handy was hired by the hotel specifically to oversee the responsibility for this. And I'd like to pass this over to Nick to give you a quick overview of the project. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everybody. I'm also joined by Marion, who's our assistant GM here. Um, so we opened on February 1st. Uh, the first slide here just shows that we have a number of hotels in London, eight in total, um, and we now have three hotels in New York. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you can see on the map where we are, obviously, 86 Warren Street between Greenwich and West Broadway. Um, next slide, please. So outline of the application. So we opened February 1st. We have 69 rooms, uh, suites and residences with 150 seat restaurant, uh, private dining room and a drawing room. So the hotel loading zone will permit servicing of the Warren Street Hotel by car, taxi, delivery vans without creating any double parking or congestion on the street. Um, the loading zone would be supervised by Warren Street Hotel staff to ensure that it functions only as a drop off zone the vehicles don't stay within the loading zone any longer than is necessary to service the hotel. Um, I've been obviously planning the opening of the hotel for a number of years and have worked closely with our direct neighbors, especially at 80 Warren Street um, and 92 Warren Street and uh, neighbors from both properties have sent over a letter of support to Mr. Bomber, uh, which I believe he, he will have received this week. Um, I'd just like to note that one of the, the, the neighbours directly east of us at 80 Warren, um, the neighbours who sent the letter, they live on the first floor, um, so are most affected by the deliveries of the hotel. So they've, uh, they're in support of the loading zone as long as it starts further west 
away from the property, uh, the property line. Um, and 92 Warren, which is to the west of us, they only have a lobby of their residential building on the first floor, and they have sent a, a letter of support uh, for the loading zone. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a brief outline of, of, of what we're uh, experiencing and, and, and what we expected uh, prior to opening, um, and this is based on um, our other two properties, Crosby Street and Whitby, and the Whitby Hotel. Uh, so we'll have up to 60 guests check in per day, uh, requiring transportation, uh, quite often in the form of a limousine, a private car or a taxi. Um, a busy bar and restaurant. Uh, we've only been open eight weeks, but we're already busy, busy this morning, um, averaging around 300 covers a day. Um, and many of, our, many of our guests often require transportation, especially on an evening like this, where we've got a lot of rain. Uh, in order to service our guests, uh, we require a large number of daily deliveries of food, uh, liquor and supplies. Uh, we have maintenance contracts, which require vendors to park in front of the hotel. And we we estimated 20 to 30 vehicles a day, and, and that's what we're currently experiencing. Uh, we're part of the five diamond set in Manhattan uh, in order to provide the expected service to our clientele. Our guests I expect to have the possibility to be dropped off at the entrance of the hotel, um, not, not in the traffic lane. Um, all of the above require the ability to park in front of the hotel for a short period. Um, a hotel loading zone would relieve the traffic issues and ultimately create a safer environment for the residents of Warren Street. Uh, furthermore, the loading zone would protect the cycle lane, which runs next to the traffic lane. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I thought I'd put a couple of photos in for those who haven't made it over to the hotel yet, but it's a very colorful, um, kind of quintessentially um, a, a British hotel. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are a couple of photos of the rooms in the hotel. Um, sorry, please. Uh, that's one of the suites on the uh, seventh floor. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's the hotel lobby looking into the uh, bar and restaurant. Uh, next slide, please. And um, the, um, the part of the dining room in the restaurant. Next slide, please. Uh, so, as with our sister hotels, the Crosby opened in 2009 and the Whitby in 2017. Uh, there's also only one lane of traffic um, and parking on either side. Um, and it's they both those hotels were granted a loading zone from the community boards as they have less than 100 rooms as well. Um, and to avoid having guests dropped off in the middle lane and the hotels do a good job of managing the hotel loading zones there. Um, whilst we don't have 100 rooms, the minimum requirement for the city, as, as Frank uh, Angelino mentioned, uh, we very much run an operation that would benefit from a loading zone. Below, just a recap of, of the number of guests and vendors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, bird's eye view, you can see where the hotel is located with the red arrow indicating uh, the 45 feet of the 72 foot, uh, foot frontage. Um, this is what was granted at the Whitby Hotel um, up in Midtown, um, and you can see it starts further west, um, away from 80 Warren Street, uh, taking into consideration our neighbours, um, Kenny Cummings and, and Deborah Triceman, um, who live on the first floor. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there you can see the, the hotel with uh, the arrow on the presentation is supposed to be a little further um, to the west. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that, that's just come up differently, uh, but starting from the property line uh, between 92 Warren and Warren Street, and then finishing up uh, just before the, um, the, the, tree, the tree furthest um, uh, to the eastern point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that concludes the presentation. Um, please let us know if you have any questions, so if I can clarify. Anything. Yeah. Uh, in your other locations that have a bike lane by the loading zone, do you are they also supervised and do the supervisors prevent double parking into the bike lane? Because we would prefer that. I yes. That so so we idea. so yeah, yeah. We, we we have a manager on <laughs> duty. We have a manager on duty at the hotel twenty four seven. Um, and a fire safety director on the property 24-7 and cameras at the front of the hotel. So 
right now we're very much on top of it. Um, we've been coaching our vendors on uh, proper etiquette in front of the hotel, making sure that they stop in front of the hotel where possible. Um, currently, the street is zoned for uh, uh, is truck loading currently from Monday through Saturday, seven a.m. to seven p.m. Um, and then residential parking 7 p.m. through the night and on Sundays. Um, so we're, we're, we're very conscious of A, the cycle lane, and B, when deliveries do arrive, that they're directed into an available spot um, during delivery hours. Now, we have deliveries um, throughout the day, and um, obviously with, with the licensing um, committee, we have our stipulations on when we can have trash pickup, uh, recycling pickup, uh, that definitely happens between uh, uh, between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. Um, at that time, um, the space in front of the hotel is residential parking, and so quite often the truck the truck has to stop in the middle of the street, uh, blocking the traffic, uh, and quite often in the in in the cycle lane unless we've asked them to move and keep it clear. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be great if um, y'all can make sure that. If there is a loading space, that the bike lane would stay clear, um, and to usher usher the passengers out safely without injuring a cyclist. Absolutely, and the way we can do that is we can encourage our doorman to open the doors of um, taxis, uh, black cabs um, from the hotel side, uh, rather than on the cycle path. That sounds great. Thank you. Is the 45 feet hey, Jess, could you go through a few photos first? I think it'll clarify some of this for the committee members. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, just so people remember where it is located, the Whole Foods is one block west of where the hotel is located. You can see where it's marked. Uh, and this is where you have the cargo bikes coming out from delivering some Amazon and Whole Foods products. So that that is a consideration for this block. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. As you can see it. This is on the DOT website, and Kate's online, and she'll I'll let her elaborate a little bit more when I'm done. The hotel zones are designated with no standing zone signs. They allow for drop off and pick up of hotel guests and to load and unload baggage. It does not include anything else on the website. So Kate's going to address that. Next, also from the DOT website, uh, this is that particular block when it's on the, the maps of commercial deliveries. And as was just mentioned, on the south side of the street, because they're on the north side of the street, the eastern half of the block is, is marked for truck loading zones. To go to the next slide, you can see that this actual signage on the street. Uh, this doesn't blow up as, you're not showing it as big, but in fact, it's marked for 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Now, Kate can answer if that's the correct sign or not, but nevertheless, that's what's physically there, because I took these on Easter Sunday. Uh, and if you go back to the next slide, you can see the bike lane. You'll notice this one. They did put fresh white paint for the lines, but it is not painted green. And the logos of the bicycle outline are not present anywhere near the hotel, which to me is somewhat of a concern for drivers to realize or anyone to realize that's actually a bike lane as they drive over it. Next. I think that's the, okay. That's. Thanks, you can go back. Uh, that's the end of pictures I wanted to clarify about what the site looks like. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Um, hi, this is Kate Sharon, New York City DOT. Um, just wanted to reiterate that the hotel loading is meant for the pickup and drop off of guests, either from private vehicles or um, cabs. Um, there is commercial loading existing on the block. Um, so I, I would add that the delivery should be um, taking place there and not at the uh, at not at a potential hotel loading zone. What do you have, Kate? What do you have to say about service vehicles? If someone comes to service the hotel, where do they go? Um, I would have to double check, but I believe if it's a 
if it's a commercial vehicle, as in it uh, has plates that are registered to a business, I believe it would be the commercial loading and unloading. Thank you, Kate. Uh, mm -hmm. Back to your question. Yeah. Uh, so it's supposed to be 45 feet. I, I mean, I support the principle of it. To me, is is that four parking spots or, or three? What do you guys? Uh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know. But, but could DOT you think, counts it as two parking spots. It's not two parking spots. Uh, uh, it's at least three parking spots at the minimum. Uh, regardless of what the, you know, uh, in, in practicality, uh, and just, you know, in the evenings and on Sunday, if these things are at a, at a premium, uh, I would propose to, I, I would be for this, but to, uh, reduce the, 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 uh, you know, at least to get one more, you know, it's not, not to have 45 feet, you know, to, to reduce it a little, just to be fair to everybody, uh, and like I said, I'm not, you know, you guys know that, but then I'm not, I don't own a car, but I just know that sometimes in, in the evenings or on Sunday, people come and visit and even one spot is at a premium. So I, I would, you know, propose, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking a car is about 10 feet. I, I mean, I mean, some a little more, some a little less. I would propose, you know, 35 feet or I mean, just something a little less uh, as, as, as a person, as a resolution. But I, I'm in principle supporting of, of this for all the other reasons that, that, that has been mentioned. There's a parking lot across the street. There's a parking lot. You know, you know, uh, you know you're right, but uh, to have to pay for 50 or 60 dollars, you know, when they could be, you know, on, on a Sunday or or or, or a two o'clock, you know, like a, a there's, there's there's one less spot on a nine o'clock at night because you're just visiting somebody. Yes, sir. Um, I was just going to throw in there. Uh, my guesstimate is that they're thinking that it's two cars because you do have to have some space to kind of pull them. Yeah, they're not going to parallel park. Right. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, if it is two cars, I, I just to me, forty-five feet is more than two cars. Two, 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 not not two like SUVs, but two, you know, two cars. So, but that's a fair point. I, I just think forty-five is a lot to enter the. But to, to give to the hotel when everything is at a premium, like and either so many times there's construction on that street. But well, they get a reason for construction. Um, well, I I would prefer there be space for at least two cars in front yeah, of the hotel. I agree. But that that's forty five feet, um, because otherwise somebody's going to try to pull in, like an Uber's going to pull in, isn't going to want to wait, or taxi's not going to wait, and they'll double park and getting in front of. The no, bike. I agree with you. I just to, I thought. I, to me, I thought 45 feet is more than two spots, even though it's two spots on paper. But uh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to vote for it. I just it was just a, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm hesitant to support this because the DOT rule says it says it should be a hundred rooms or more than it would be a yes. Well, from their side, that's where they're coming here. Okay. Hey, for, yeah. What well, were you concerned? It's, it's that's as of right. I think it's not. Like you don't get it if it's not hundred feet. It's just that they have a different process. Am I right about that? Hey, Kate. Hey, Kate. Yeah. So, if the, yeah. If the typically we grant the hotel loading zones for hotels that have a hundred rooms or more, um, but we also recognize that this could be a quality of life issue that the community board wants to support. So we defer um, to your considerations on this. Great. So then. 100 rooms, 100 rooms, I'm assuming that's the threshold because it, it, it would warrant the, the space for the, the percentage of people that would, would need to use that, that hotel loading zone. But with 69 cars, not even, not even close to 100, I, I'm concerned that they're going to have dedicated space left open and it won't be fully used by, by their guests. And it shouldn't be used for their commercial vendors. Um, it, and then also on the other side of the street, it's practically all loading. It's all a loading zone during the day. So I, I'm hesitant to give it that preference. A um, couple of things that are coming to mind for me. One, can they address the fact that they were referencing um, commercial uh, vendors using that? Two, how does that, how does that impact the diner on the corner? And also, why can't they use the same space that the 
designer uses to load since it's like steps away. Three, um, say you were talking about the 69 rooms. Pretty sure I've read both on your website and other places that like many of those rooms are actually for long term leases instead of like it's not like everyday usage. So I would love to hear from the team how they are thinking about that and how they're approaching that. Absolutely. So um, gee where's the diner on the corner? Um, obviously, they uh, have food and beverage deliveries. Um, we as a hotel, we have linens and staff uniforms that are delivered in the evenings at around 10, 11 p.m., at which point um, the current truck loading zone has expired in its residential parking. Um, we have trash pickup every day at 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., um, so Without a loading zone, there are cars parked every night in front of the hotel. And right now, the um, the, the, the wits truck is part is double parking every day. Um, and with regards to the top three floors of the hotel, they are for um, their as uh, residences. They're part of Warren Street Hotel um, for thirty days or longer. Um, and the rest of the hotel, the 57 rooms and suites, uh, we have as transient business. Um, and I, I ran through in the presentation how many deliveries and how many um, vendors we have and, and the number of guests arriving in, in the hotel as well. And regardless of, of the fact if someone is uh, staying in a residence, um, the majority of our guests do have a car that will pick them up from the hotel or they will use a cab that will come and pick them up from the hotel. Um, I'd just like to point out as well that as a hotel, we have a limousine service that we work with, and we only allow them to arrive uh, a maximum of 10 minutes before the guests get picked up at the hotel. So we, we, we do not have um, a, an, the other two hotels um, kind of black SUVs idling outside the hotel. We're very conscious of that, uh, and, and we've spoken to our, our neighbours about that and we've had concerns. I'm sorry if I missed I really, any of the other questions there. But. No, I think I answered them. To be honest, I would like to actually add to the resolution that like we actually specify that they don't use it for vendor parking because that's not what hotel zoning uh, is for, um, and I don't want to see it become that. Um, I don't think it justifies vendor parking with uh, the garbage trucks or getting linens, et cetera, delivered. Um, or any of the other stuff, seeing that the other companies and cars, and there is a uh, space for vendor parking. Could I assume that a lot of you guys and women want to would be in favor of? Hey guys, but, you know, can we let yeah. people whose well, hands are okay. up online speak as well? Yeah, yeah sorry. I yes, that's fine. <laughs> neglected to look. Who do we have? I was trying to be patient. It's me. Betty also has her hand up as well as Marianne Braverman. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask three questions. First of all, um, do you have any plans now or would you be willing to go on record saying that you will not turn the hotel loading zone into dine out New York City? Uh, absolutely, we will not turn the loading zone into dine out, dine out city. Because my concern, obviously, roadway cafes are allowed in hotel loading zones. So that would be one of the things, whereas right now you couldn't put it there during the commercial parking during the hours, but you could put it there afterwards, I believe, if I understand the rules on the setup. Area. We, we, um, we'll have to go on record that we would not do that um, on, okay. the, on the basis that we we're, we're we're asking for a loading zone for the reasons stipulated in the presentation, uh, and that's based on our experience at our other two hotels. And at neither of those hotels have we put uh, a dine out in in the loading zone. So that would be something that we would put in the resolution. I would assume for the committee. I, I leave it to theirs, but to to denote that. And did you already send letters of support from the neighboring businesses? I do echo the concerns that are raised about the amount of parking that we have and what we're doing to the commercial spaces that are available for deliveries. I denote that because on the corner where G Wiz is, they have taken off the commercial parking because they do have roadbed dining. 
So we have lost already uh, roadbed dining on the Warren Street side of, we have lost the commercial availability for parking over on that side. So the street is already shrinking and trying to find a way to balance that with the needs of the people to be dropped off safely. And obviously the needs for the bicyclist to not be run over is paramount. I would say that I question the 45 feet, whether maybe that could be shrunk just a little bit. And that's a question I'd love to be answered either by Kate or someone else, because we're talking 57 rooms. We're not talking, you know, a hundred, so to speak. So the roadbed dining, thank you for the confirmation. I haven't seen a letter come in about the local support for the removal of the commercial parking, which would be something I'd like to see. And then lastly, sir, your choice to have your garbage pick up between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. is a choice that is made. I would suffice to tell you that it would be better if those pickups were done during the commercial parking hours, which is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 6 p.m., which would then actually not also affect having a loud garbage truck waking up the neighbors. So I appreciate that you have a loading dock issue so to speak and you would you have troubles with the garbage pickup but it's a fairly quiet block um, in the evenings not that heavily trafficked because it's mostly residential above the ground floor so i would question as to why you can't do garbage pickup between the commercial hours that are available to you on the street see base the operation of the hotel based on Crosby Street and the Whitby Hotel. And the issue is that our garbage vendors do not start until the commercial late in the evening. And so we, when we were with the licensing committee, um, we agreed with them that 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. would work because we had already spoken to our garbage pickup company um, who had said that would be the earliest they could come and pick up. Um, at the other hotels, it happens in the middle of the night between uh, 1 a.m. And, and, and 5 a.m. Um, and we were already very conscious of our neighbours. And when we went to the licensing committee, explained that to them. Um, and hence the reason why our commercial waste gets picked up between 10 and 1. Uh, what's the address again? I apologize. Uh, 80, 80, 86 Warren Street. Yeah, I'm just going to, and I apologize. It's not that I do not believe you. I'm just going to look at what the stipulation says on there. So I have it. But with that, I thank you very much for the presentation and thank you. Did you say that you had already the letters of local support or you were still gathering that and sending it? They sent uh, an email directly to Mr. Bomber. I thought you said they're coming next week within a week. There was there was something you forwarded us. There was an email from Deborah Treisman, who lives at 80 Warren Street, um, and Amanda Pashalinski, who lives directly west of us um, at 92 Warren Street. I'm not actually looking for the residentials. Right. Um, because what I'm looking for is where it really impacts for me is the small business operators that surround you on that block. Sure. So, you know, uh, uh, those residents may not have cars. They don't care. I'm not really worried about a couple sure. parking spots for residents. It's already pretty brutal over there. Um, yeah. I'm really worried about the other commercial businesses that are on the street and not negatively impacting them. I'll send over those lines of support. And then Kate, I guess my question for you and thank you very much everyone for the time is. This is a loading dock request for the entirety of the bill of the front of the building with something quite so small. Um, the, the request is for 45 feet of 72, um, and this is what was granted at the Whitby Hotel. The Whitby Hotel frontage is um, the same as Warren Street in Midtown, and we originally had applied for a, the full uh, width of the building, um, hence why we reduced it to 45 based on our experience with the community board in Midtown. You know what, Mitch, it doesn't make a difference because 
what they have in CB5 is not the same as what has in CB1. You know, I don't know. I don't know if that, if that block is a residential block with just local commercial, if there's far more commercial, we don't know if that block has roadbed dining, like it, it's comparing apples and oranges well, in some ways. I agree with you. That, that's that, that was, I was going to make that point, but you did, you made it. So thank you. Um, Betty. I just want to point out that if people look at the photo that's up now, there are only three cars parked in front, and that's for the full 72 feet. So the 45 feet really only does cover two vehicles, and that's not them pulling in and out. And you don't want them lingering a lot in front of the bike lane in order to parallel park effectively with less space. So I, I have no, personally, I have no problems with the 45 feet for those reasons. But what I do want to bring up is that the Transportation Committee uh, in general has brought up for any of the vendors in our area that they use on any of their promotional materials, website, et cetera, information about sustainable forms of transportation that can be used because we're trying to whittle away the number of people who rely on vehicles, but also to give them an option as congestion pricing comes in and some would choose to know what the options are. So including things such as the closest subway stops bus line and stops where the closest city bike is. Uh, it was, since you're not too, too far from using the ferries, but giving some of the options that would be not terribly inconvenient would be the best for your guests coming or going or visiting. Yeah. You let them answer, please. What was that? You let them answer, please. Yeah. Thank you for that. Absolutely. And the, the limousine company that we use already has electric vehicles. Our concierge has been working on a local guide, which includes the subway stops, includes the ferries. Um, and that information is in the rooms as well in the compendium. Thank you. Yeah. Please discourage your guests from using limousines. You are in one of the most transit rich areas in the, in the world. So please discourage them from using any vehicle, even if electric. Yes, Mitch. Somebody's paying a thousand dollars a night. They're going to use whatever they want. It, it's a a nice thought, but that, could that's could you clarify? Just can so, you can uh, we get clarification on one other thing? He said there's only three long term stay guest rooms, but on the liquor license application, there were twelve. I said the top three floors of the hotel, and there are twelve in total out of sixty nine, and there are fifty seven rooms and suites for transit. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. My pleasure. Just, uh, I was going to let it go, but since I, I wait, hear excuse me, wait, don't support. forget Marianne. Sorry, I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Sorry about that. Thank you for waiting. I raised my hand a while back when we were talking about uh, managing the activity in that space if there is a loading zone because of all the different things that are happening right there. And I think what I heard was that you have two people inside the building who would have cameras looking out, but you're going to need people for most of the daylight hours, I would think, out there making sure uh -huh. that vehicles are not blocking the bike lane and also leaving line of sight. That's one of the difficult things with bicycles no bicycle wants to go down that narrow lane with a car on either side because we don't know who's going to open a door and knock us over. So th there's got to be somebody with a little awareness out there to be sure that they're, they're not sitting in the traffic lane, even if briefly, and then, you know, dragging luggage across the bicycle lane if it's a busy time. You, you need somebody there to, to move them along. Thank you. So to, to, to clarify for the, we have a full team of doormen um, yeah. who are stationed outside. We have the canopy there to keep them dry. Um, they cover the door every day from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. After 10 p.m., we have a night manager and night front desk agent um, who are there um, to keep an eye on the front of the hotel. And from 3 a.m., we have our goods receivers who are there um, at the service entrance of the hotel, ensuring that all of our delivery drivers 
are not idling, are turning off their engines after um, three minutes. Um, and, and, and we really worked so hard, especially with Deborah and Kenny, who are at 80 Warren with our vendors. Because there's a slight slope of Warren Street, they automatically pull up in front of 80 Warren because it's easy that easier than to take deliveries down. So we've really worked with our with our neighbors um, in order to listen to them, work with our vendors and try and improve the experience uh, and quality of life on the street. Okay, as long as the doormen understand that they need to watch out, you know, beyond just the guests getting in. Absolutely. That, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to point out. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to kind of let it go, but uh, happy that Tammy echoed one or two of the points that I had made before. So I would like to bring back of shrinking by a little, at least to, to put it on the table. Uh, Mitch, the, uh, can I clarify a couple yes. of things? Yes. And I apologize, gentlemen, because I did pull up the liquor license uh, application. It said delivery of goods and services, uh, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Generally, with evening delivery of linens. Correct. And then uh, so the large stipulations. That's what it mentions: the garbage pickup, which is 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Okay. And you are still planning to come back to us for a sidewalk cafe after some time. Uh, potentially, but absolutely not in any part of the road. If that makes sense. Yes, it does, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Of course. So I would like to bring back the shrinking by a little, the the uh, the uh, forty five feet, and uh, oh no, I had a senior moment. Uh, oh, and while it would be in a perfect world, it would be great if you didn't have to parallel park. But I mean, that's a reality in in, in in New York. I mean, you you have to parallel park, and to take extra feet because you don't some you don't want to have parallel parking. To me, that's kind of real. Elitism and you know everything else about protecting for the bike lane. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of, of of all that other things, but but not wanting parallel parking. So to, to increase the, the space, I mean that's that's I think that's I don't want to say selfish is the wrong word because uh, I respect everybody here, but that's I think that's going one step a little too far. Well, I mean it's it's, it's just reality. I mean if if it's if, if a Uber has to parallel park in order to drop someone off for 30 seconds, I'm confident in saying that over the course of a year, zero Ubers will do that. Right. Um, so they will sit in the bike lane and defeat the purpose of loading someone off. Yes. But they they have to wait on the court. You know, if there's two spots or three spots. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I just there's a diner. Yeah. Got it. Okay. No, I think inevitably there will be cars blocking the bike lane. I mean, Barkley Street, either way, Street, Larry Silver Street, so tell, is like every day that I ride through there, it's like dodgeball, you know, because the, there are so many people pulling in and darting in and darting out. The number of cars that they say are going to be coming to the hotel daily. It's going to happen. I'm, I'm just sort of resigned. I don't even think for the guests, excuse me, they were, they were saying like 300 people at the uh, you know, at the, uh, for the restaurant and the bar, they, they're going to be having, I think it's going to be turning into like a destination and more than just, you know, there's not going to be like a hundred people like checking in, you know, uh, you know, uh, and it's just anyway. Hopefully it doesn't jump that stretch. But okay, so. But the parallel parking is, is I mean, that's a, you know, reality. There's going to be blockage. Anyway. Well, there's a difference between people parallel parking in order to keep their vehicle there for a night or longer and dropping people off, which yeah. is the point of the loading zone. Um, it's not exactly. Okay. Part, I mean, but, I mean, what do, you, what do people think? Would anyone else be in favor? Don't want to. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Whatever the majority is, we yeah. serve in a democracy, barely. <laughs> Jess, do you want to go on to the next slide? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I haven't done this before, but I have. And what it what has to be clarified, I underlined those areas where the biggest decision has to be made. And if it does support, if or is it does not support unless is why those words are underlined. And then I tried to cover what uh, different people brought up in the bullet points below, and you can look at those quickly, but <coughs> Do 
Did you just type Betty, it Betty, can you also ask that? I mean, we haven't seen the commercial operators, the local commercial feedback. So I have concerns that the commercial, unless they have letters of support from from the neighboring commercial operations. How would that space do them any good? Because they have this space in front of their own buildings. But not all of them do. That's kind of the thing. It's commercial parking. That's, I mean, that's the question. We, it was a hotbed in licensing for a couple of different things for hours for this, for that. I'd just like to make sure that we are inclusive of, of the neighboring and including the German school and the other neighboring businesses to ensure that there is enough commercial parking left after roadbed dining and after a hotel loading zone for the other operators on the street. But this isn't taking away commercial loading. It is, yeah. Betty. It's taking away commercial parking. I don't understand how, but okay. Is it a loading zone or is it a parking zone? No, it's a parking zone. Is there more on the next slide? I see it. You can correct me, but I, I believe this uh, hotel was built in place where it used to be a parking lot. The building was for parking, correct? So that's correct, yes. And there was only one parking space in the previous years. There was an entry into the car park and an entry out of the private car park. Um, and for the record, I am in support, uh, just, but I have to jot off. I just want to make sure that we're inclusive of the needs of the neighbors around and thank everybody for the presentation. Have a wonderful day. Stay dry. Uh, pleasure. Thank you very much. It's the point of this last bullet on this slide to say, basically, we want to make sure they don't use it for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions. Or, wait, 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 Jess, please make sure we straighten out what the underlined area to get the confirmed wording. I don't want to leave that hanging, so I don't know what it is. And the last one to answer, Brendan, it was to follow the DOT regulations, which appear to say that, but Kate, as she said, is going to go clarify that exactly what they are for hotel loading zones. Okay. And there is a second part to us. You want to look one more slide? But what if what if we did a, a conditional like conditional for a year that they you know effectively keep the uh, bike lane clear from their traffic? Well, that's why it says agree it as long as. No, but I mean make the make the loading zone uh, uh, temporary. Yeah, just like we do with licenses for the hours. I, you really don't want to do that because you're just not really looked after. It's more, it's easier to look at the conditional and say if they're blowing it over and over again, why wait a year? It's possible that you can do it like for a year. Yeah, so just go up a slide. Go up a slide, please. The licensing committee, right? Sorry. Up. What's that? Thank you. Look at the underlined. Does not support unless. Or yeah, what, what are you referring to? Just that's how the, we do it in licensing, right? Yeah. <clears throat> right. So if you accept that wording, then if they blow any of these <sighs> things over and over again, that would be a reason to not to ask the DOT to take it. But I'll call it. Okay. We confirmed it. Okay, we can switch the word ferry to yacht. If we keep it closed, will it make it warmer? Huh? If it's closed, will it make it warmer? I'm good with all this. If I get live. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we don't do only if for a license thing as well, but that's a battle we'll fight another day instead of no. That's just. I'm the investment for in and this. Yes. Um, all the questions. Did we need, sorry, sorry. Uh, did we need to answer the, the question to Kate um, about the one year thing? Does that matter? Do we care about that? Okay. I thought that it was exactly a good point, but it's still what a majority rules. But let's hear what the answer is, unless she yeah. doesn't know. 
Sorry, what was okay. the question? If we would consider a one year temporary loading zone? Is that a thing? And would you consider it? Yeah. I'm not aware that we've done that previously. Uh, if you made a request, we would consider it, but I, I can't guarantee we would we would agree to that. And I can tell you from experience that it does not work for us as a committee because we have done that before. Yeah. Uh, but, okay. So what if um, we came to you in three months and said this isn't working? We take it back. <laughs> I think we would, yeah, if, if there was a resolution from the community board to that effect, we would likely um, honor that since considering that this location, you know, didn't meet the 100 room requirement and we're deferring to you now. Um, I think if it was an issue down the line, we would consider removing it. Uh, so we keeping this language saying maybe just adding uh, if this language is not adhered to that we have the right we have the right to revoke it or or to, to bring it up because they could say listen we have it too bad you know we, we want to keep it so i mean it sounds like we have that assurance already i mean it's it, well just because we put it in a resolution doesn't mean it's it's just it's it's it's, it's, it's written instead of verbal yeah well, like i said it's your call. okay the more obvious yeah. question is that, kate if you look at the third bullet that could be more under the DOT control and the hotel have nothing to do with it. What is your comment on that? Is that all DOT? Yeah, that, yeah, the markings are all DOT. Um, and if you include that in the resolution, we can definitely raise that uh, to our bikes team uh, who oversees the markings. Great, well then I will inform the hotel that this really is more to put some pressure on the DOT to do it or to work with you to do it. You may have to remind them to do it, but uh, it's very likely the DOT wouldn't allow you to even do it. Okay. Okay. Second. Second. All right. Good. We'll do it by affirmation again. All those opposed. You. Any abstentions? Any recusals? Betty, just so we have the yes. rest. State your name, please. I'm just teasing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Thank so you. motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. you too. That's cool. I haven't been there yet. Yeah. Let's go get a drink. Yeah, you'll you'll it looks beautiful. Your limo is waiting downstairs for you. Yeah, for only 10 minutes. Okay. We each take our own limo. I, I think <laughs> we should substitute the word yacht for, for ferry because they're not going to take a ferry. We should take bicycles over there. Yeah. Also, together. We probably have. And once that they come out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there are. Are they parked on? I think the reason we can make no jacket. There are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you should this like Texas. I usually feel really hot. So uh, right. uh, suitcases on the subway from JFK go to the thousand dollar hotel. For that, that's fine. Like, the airport. <laughs> okay, everybody. Okay. This is in, this in response right. to Mimi's comment last month. Just to remind people. And if you go up, because yeah. we skipped, there's something we're skipped because this isn't the name of it. Keep coming mm. up to the item number. This one. This was the law that Mimi had asked about. That the name of the title of it is required moped dealers to provide ownership information at point of sale. Next, a little bit of information. This does. This is taken directly from the bill, and it's a New York City bill. Requires limited use motorcycles or mopeds retailers to provide ownership requirement information at the point of sale. Uh, and this is the most that New York City can do without state action. So don't tell me it's too soft. The state is working in this area too. There's a Senate bill and an assembly bill that are partner bills. 
partner yeah. bills and may require that limited use motorcycles be registered at the point of sale. But this would actually do that piece. And they're both currently in committee. The New York DMV classifies a moped in three different classes, the A, which are 30 to 40 mile per hour, and the Bs, which are oh. over 20 to 30, and class Cs, which are 20 miles per hour and less. So there is a range, not all mopeds are the same, but they're all considered limited use motorcycles uh, and are called, classified by the oh. top speed. And only, and I think Mimi for this, only a manufacturer certified model of a limited use motorcycle can get registration in New York. And I'm going to guess maybe this is those that are dirt bikes or those that really just aren't manufactured registered. Uh, do you mean the classes? Well, there are things called dirt bikes that some people consider mopeds. And I'm going to guess yeah, and they are not legal. Bikes. They're not legal because they don't have the required safety um, equipment. So safety equipment on a moped and a motorcycle includes lights. Signals, the brake oh, lights, like brakes, um, and so brakes. Big deal. They don't have brakes. Really. They do. It's just the dirt bikes have sometimes don't have lights or signals. Oh, yeah. And they're called dirt bikes, then, correct? Yeah. And then you shouldn't ride those on the street because they're wildly dangerous. And so are these. So they, they are. They are outright illegal in New York as well. But I just want, since people look at the range of things that are out there on the road. Those are also dirt bikes and how they differ from mopeds. So thank you for the clarification. And we're back to the bill that we're talking about that would require the city of New York Department of Consumer Worker Protection in coordination with the DOT to develop and distribute materials related to the operation of mopeds. If you want to know what they're, what they're doing. Uh, that includes the information related to registration, inspection, insurance, operation, and traffic safety requirements. And this would have to be distributed by the moped de retailers themselves at the point of sale, which they currently are not. And this is taken from the D DMV website. You can see there are all kinds of things written about these three classes and the different differing requirements for them. If you go to the next slide, it's a little easier for people to read. It covers kind of the same information. So they do need a driver's license with appropriate endorsement. So don't consider them an e-bike. They're not. Oh, only only class A's require a license with the appropriate endorsement. The other two classes just need a driver's license. Well, the second one, I see mopeds on bike lanes and sidewalks all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, because they're not given any information would be the argument, but they. Oh, they that, that's a, that, no, no disrespect to you. Yes, that's true. If, if they, they, you don't need to educate anybody anymore about you not you shouldn't ride a moped on a sidewalk or, or you know, you know, I mean, that that's just a, you know. You shouldn't have to, but if, if, poor excuse. We're not if, talking about, I mean. If they don't have a license already, they might not know that they're not supposed to ride it on a sidewalk. You're not supposed to ride a bicycle on a sidewalk either. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah, so legislators are trying to dot the I's and cross the T's. And in New York City, they're saying, let's at least educate them about what the requirements are and what their responsibilities are. Right. And these are the various things they, they have. Mopeds are restricted from major bridges, including the Brooklyn Bridge, which is either misunderstood by moped drivers or is circumvented by them by illegally using the bike lane, which then sucks in this lack of safety to the cyclists. Okay, so I think, you know, it is important. Uh, Manhattan Community Board 1 district, also being the central business district holding zone, enters the whole bit of motorcycles and hence limited use motorcycles would be charged at half the tolling rate. But if there's no license plate, obviously they're also circumventing that. They're circumventing any kind of red light restrictions for speeding or otherwise. So that there are, you start to get into those issues too of a vehicle not having any identification on them. They become a ghost vehicle. 
So Mimi, if you'd like to make some comments since you have the knowledge really of. Yeah, so overall, this is um, so that when someone buys a moped, they will get the appropriate information about what is required of them for it, right? Like some mopeds require an inspection, some uh, require a certain endorsement on your license, which means extra training um, because they're wildly dangerous vehicles. And um, but this is really just to give out informational pamphlets, right? Like when you generally when you buy like a full fledged motorcycle that's not um, a class A moped, you would be required to get insurance before you pay for it and uh, register it with the state at the point of sale, and they would give you a license plate with your registration sticker and an inspection sticker. Um, and they would explain what else you need to do. So uh, this would just do that. Well, this would just explain what you need to do, but not have um, registration. I, I actually think the last paragraph is the best thing. Uh, that at the point of sale, you cannot leave the dealer without a license plate. I mean, the education is great and everything, but that's that puts everything to me. That that's the main point right there. Why I would support that is the license plate thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have a question. I'm trying to understand. So, Betty, you mentioned something about the state assembly and the Senate. They're trying. They have some some bills. But right, that's the bill part. Be it resolved through the resolve through the second statement here it is to look at if you go back one. This is to get after our state representatives to say, yes, continue with those bills. Yeah. So we're essentially okay. referencing three different pieces of legislation, but mm -hmm. this is mostly for the, um, the New York City based legislation with a right. reference to the other two. Uh, right. the so intro 132 2024 is what Mimi is talking about, and that it would go to our city representatives to say, pass this and at least get people educated. I know we were we were revising this, um, Betty, but if we uh, if we have if it's not in the current draft, I think we should mention the the uh, the names of the bills and the therefore be a result for the Senate and say some of the bills. Is that last paragraph in the bill uh, or is that just a suggestion we're making? No, that that's that yeah, that's that's our that's our that's confusion. Yeah, yeah but that, that means the bills. most yeah. important that thing is really there. support. Hundred yeah. percent. Um, right. So, so these two bills could be added to the resolution to the statement of resolve. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's no problem. Yeah. Oh, love it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't see any of this as objectionable. Like, this is all pretty no brainer to me. So let's. <laughs> but then, my thing is, why are we excluding e bikes that can achieve the same speed and not classifying them as as type as class C? It's not in this legislation. Yeah, I I think we're for whatever reason, political. I mean, um, outside of us is. They're excluding that whole class of e-bikes, which have can achieve the same speeds, and, and they're getting stronger and faster, and they should be included in it. But okay, so yeah, it's not in this legislation. This is just about this legislation. But point taken. I think we there is talk of legislation yeah. in the city regarding that. I think we did bring it up at a previous meeting, and it went so haywire that we said, uh, <laughs> "Stop it." Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> Eric, I agree with you, but to not lose this. I yeah, think it would be important right. to do that, and even though I would like it to be combined, but and not at the risk of losing this. Right. They're also more dangerous in the sense of size. They're boxy. They're gas powered. Cody is the same. Not all of them are gas powered. Some of them. Uh, some of them. <laughs> some mopeds uh, are electric. Some they are. That's true. Yeah. I mean, the, a lot of them. Uh, yeah, a lot of them are not, the, but, but the, the the wording in the law is that um, they're motorized vehicles that go, or they're vehicles that go over a certain miles per hour, and so that doesn't exclude some electric vehicles. I do wish that there was, you know, I mean, not, not that for this, like, but, but just, just as an aside, you know, the fact that they are bigger, you know, they're more, uh, they carry more weight, they're much more... They sound a lot like a cargo bike, don't they? An e-cargo bike. 
Whoa, whoa. <laughs> they, they'll be heavy. With a trailer. You know, and hands and feet. Let's do it like a boat on this, right? Okay. Yeah, let's, let's have this discussion in, in about a half an hour. You guys like to take all the questions on the second? Anything else on this resolution? Well, I'm just going to let somebody else call it. Is there anything? Is there anyone on this? Like, neglected? And not a highly meaning person, as you can tell. <laughs> It's been four years, man. <laughs> One of the others, but man had her hand up for a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, case. Cody got it. No choice then. Um, okay. All those opposed. <laughs> We're all like <laughs> not just us. Use open. Betty. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm glad the last paragraph really that's you know, you know somebody gets hit and you don't know right. open the street. Yeah. You don't know how about so it. Have ID. Um Betty, you wanna give us away on our second to last the magical movie. mystery tool. <laughs> 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 but you got that from your parents? <laughs> or Mrs. Age. Okay, if yeah, just go back to this one. So yes. Uh we've got a letter from the DOT. These are for open street renewals. Both of these streets that are coming up for renewal have been around for two or three years without any real significant complaints. So I'm going to oh. put this through so you can hear and opine on them. However, only look where there is something that is a difference from the past that's substantiated. Otherwise, status quo okay. is going to go forward. Next. We'll get the picture, you'll get the DOT information about what the request is. And you'll see that, that both of them, like I said, have been around in the past and they're not asking for anything more. If anything, the start date and end date, that period of time has been shortened, probably to be more in conjunction with when the better weather season, where before they just gave all 365 days of the year. Anyway, Dwayne Street to Hudson Street, I'm sorry, Dwayne Street between Hudson and West Broadway. And this has been managed by uh, the Keogh restaurant. So there's been no change in who this, the, re, the local partner is. Uh, starting date is April 20th, like I said, till November the 17th. And they will operate seven days a week from 11 a.m., which I believe is a little bit later, and ending at, at 10 p.m and on the weekend at 11 p.m. Know of anything? Whoops, go back. Okay, we can go to the second one. This is Peck Slip, and this one is sponsored by the Peck Slip School. Uh, this, again, no real changes from last year. If anything, it's been shortened a bit to go more with the school year. Nevertheless, you can see it's really school hours that they are operational. So, well, are there any uh, particular comp novel complaints? Mitch, is about does the Dwayne Street between Greenwich, yeah. no, between Hudson, right? During it was it was it was apropos during COVID because people were di dining; they had the tables and everything in the streets. Mm -hmm. Once that finished, the Roadbed dining that they have now, there's nobody in the streets. It's just it's just like anything like where it's it's closed off from the, the, there in the, in the parking spots, and then there it's just to the street to the to the restaurant, uh, because there's now placards are using them to park their cars on the on the across the street. There's no there's nobody eating in the street. There's nobody walking in the street. There's nobody playing in the street. It's it's arbitrary. So. There's no reason to close that street down. Well, wait, wait, wait. Is that true? I mean, well, maybe now it's, it's the open street isn't. But even 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 in the warm weather over the last year or two, like after everything opened up, uh, during the, during COVID, 
there was tables and chairs in the whole street. Yeah, yeah. That is now just it's just like any of the roadbed diners, like you said, the G Wiz and everything like that. People, you know, it's it's enclosed on you know one side, and then you know the the way to uh, like a shattered. Like nobody, there's nothing. It's just like it's just the regular roadbed diner. It's not like two ways. Yeah. And that one, I would be totally against it uh, because it's. I think one side there was a couple of a few meter spots, and then uh, I mean bikes are like going through anyway, which no problem. That's that's great, but I mean you have to see. You, you've seen. You, you know what I'm talking about? Of course. Yes. There's no. There's no. There's no. There's no foot traffic. There's no uh, mm -hmm. people. There's foot traffic. No, no, no. What I'm saying is there's no. There's no foot traffic in the street. It's like there's no. Uh, so, you know, I'm sorry. Um, this is like only one data point, but one, um, I think about days like today where I don't know why this, that corner so bad, but like that corner floods tremendously. And so then I can actually go around into the street when it's closed. You're talking about from Hudson or from Greenwich? It's on... The one from Greenwich, the one making a left on Greenwich. Yeah. Way on Greenwich. No, this yeah. is not, this is not, the, the left I think that you're talking about is coming down Greenwich and making a left on Dwayne. This is like from Hudson in. It's, it, that's that's not like. You're a, talking about where the um, where the sub sushi place is on that corner. Yeah, sushi car. Yeah, yeah. that's what's probably. Yeah. Okay. So there. So I walk in the street for that, and then also again, it's a single data point. But um, they play jazz uh, um, over during the summer, and so I actually literally just like sit across the street, right, um, and enjoy the jazz without having to go get drinks or food from Starbucks. <laughs> Like this particular stretch, the jazz is on, in, on the streets, so like like from the roadbed to the uh, in, in the in they the play uh, in the restaurant. They play in the restaurant. They play in the restaurant, but you like, can deal with it. You're not the floor. It's not just about like whether there are people eating there, whether there are playing music there. It's it's also just like it's a it's a nice closed off area where there are no cars, where people can just like enjoy but they, themselves. But the, not, but the placards parked there. They do because there. They, there's no traffic going through while you're sitting there eating. Like, they, it, they, this is, there's there's nobody eating in this in, no, in that street. That, it, there was during the pandemic. I, I, I feel like last year they put some tables out, but like it's not in the street. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, on, 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 but but next yeah, to the road. Let's, let's let's make this fair. Okay, so. But, um, I'd be against yeah, that. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I think this is a good example of like a open street that's working very well because this is not a particularly highly trafficked area for cars, and like we don't we don't need cars going through on Dwayne Street. There, it's like one tiny little stretch. You know what? Uh, you know, I would I would close all of Dwayne Street. Going well, you, you you know that then you can't have to, well, you, you know all the streets. Well, just, but you know what's across the street from your building, so you can't do that. Um, what the fire? Yeah. And, and how many trucks? Well, there's, there's deliveries all the time. Yeah, Dwayne, Dwayne Street goes the other way. Firehouse, they can't go down Dwayne Street that way. No, what I'm saying is that that's one thing, like that's one block from, after you cross West Broadway, like there's, that's one of the few blocks that goes like east to west up to, Bro I mean, west to east up to Broadway. Anyway, I. So you're opposed to that. I'm, I'm, Are we going to take them? I was, and I, I had brought this up a while ago, like a few years ago, but uh, since yeah. it just came up, I would be opposed to that one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mitch, you complain about this one every year, but the reality is yeah. we don't get any complaints from the general public. More importantly, I put it on the agenda so that the public would see it and come out, which they have for other items, which makes me also believe there still isn't a real problem. And last year, I, Carrie I, Davidson was, wait one second. Last year, Carrie Davidson was in attendance. She couldn't be tonight. She also spoke, she's on the next block of Dwayne Street and said they had no problems and it worked very well for them with Keo being the partner. I know Eric has some answers. Yeah, but if people aren't using it, I, I, don't, I, don't, I have reservations about having streets closed, but it's not really being utilized. I, I support having the streets closed for specific days, but this is every day. That every, it's, every, it's Monday through, it's every day, correct? So it should be, Maybe for specific days or specific events, but not not people are scared to day. park or like like overnight, like or on you know because they have that like they have the size up there. But to show that it's not impeding in anybody else's like existence, the the spots are taken completely by the placards because they don't have to worry about it. But so there 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 are cars there that are not impeding anything because they're on the opposite side of the street from where the the the, the restaurant is and. 
you know, that's, you know, something that's that's not right. You're not, you're not, we're not going to stop the placards. So why, will, so why is the solution to open the street to cars? <laughs> no, well, what I'm saying is that there's a whole side of streets. Are you easier for them? The park there illegally? There's something if, 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 if you if you if you would, uh, come home at two o'clock in the morning and you want to you don't have you don't have to get up you know like on on, on, a, on a Saturday and from work or whatever and you know you can't you could park there before but now you can't park there because of the sign but their cars are parking there and the placards are there so they're not impeding anybody because they're physically there I've mentioned that to you before yeah. You are yeah, but the cars are only restricted during the hours, so 2 a.m. wouldn't be affected anyway. <laughs> right, but you have to you have to move it early in the, in the morning. The thing is, I I've mentioned it in the last couple of years, Betty, and be, I know. specifically for this reason. Right, so I'm sorry it bothers you. You would like to have like no cars in the in the whole you know city, and you know. No, I'm just saying your your solution isn't an answer to the problem that you you have. There was no, but there was no problem before, Betty. Before the pandemic, that was the regular street. There was no problem before. There was no problem for the cars. Dur during the pandemic, there was a problem, and then the pandemic, the, the, that was over, and so it should go back to the way it was because it wasn't a problem for anybody. So, Betty, are we doing resolutions here, or were you just bringing this up? No, I was bringing it up to hear if anything novel came up, which I have not heard yet. Uh, if your concern is they need to do more programming, then we can certainly ask them what their plan is for providing programming on the street. I'm all for closing down the streets on for programming and for this and that and for jazz night and for whatever, you know, whatever. But this was, you know, like uh, three quarters of the year, 24 seven. Schools do that too. I think open street. I think it would be great to encourage local businesses to, you know, to take advantage of open streets, open street programs, because open streets can build community, hot for local community, because people see this space and discover it. I agree with you, but they're like, not using. They weren't. They haven't been using it for open streets. Okay. And discover that space is, you know, car free. It's like it's a refuge. It becomes like I, I you know, I, I think community members can, you know. Take advantage of it if they know more about it and they understand that it does push up a very, and I think this is an example of where it does create like a very nice atmosphere like that. There's also a bar next door that has outdoor seating next to Keto, and it like in Tribeca, especially where there's not a ton going on at night, but like that street is kind of like bustling that block. It's, it's, it's nice from the roadbed in, not from the other I, side. I know. I mean, just because nobody's yeah. hanging out in the middle of the street or across the street except for the placard cars. But uh, I love hearing like what you said, you know, sitting across the street and listening to jazz. Like, and I think that's just so cool. You yeah. know, I mean, it's like it's it, it, is, it would be impeded if there are cars going. If there are cars sipping by. Right, he sits across the street, then I'm for it. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Stop that anyway, this, this, I'll be outvoted, but I, I, I don't. Yeah. Just, just, just one uh, note. Uh, uh, my previous work I was with uh, Department of Small Business Services and the uh, open street uh, businesses that were on open streets uh, did generally did better than uh, adjacent uh, streets that did not have open streets and a lot of times the neighboring streets would complain because they didn't have an open street um, and they're you know, the, the adjacent block was just taking a lot of. I wish there was one way business. showing. I think it shows you that they are a great, uh, generally a great boon. Then is there some way to, on that block. to keeping keeping it like that, but to allow the cars like where the placard cars are parking across the street, across from the side of the, the roadbeds so that they, those spots are not lost. That whole block is not lost. Where you can, you know, like sometimes the street is closed, but you live there, and you can kind of like pull the car in, and but you know, but, so there's no through traffic, but at least a, a car can park, and you can you only go in up there. And they put up barricades to be wired to. There's obviously Kia might hear you say this tonight, and they're probably going to fill it up with tables now because they're like, oh, we didn't utilize. So I think honestly, what we're getting at is like we're making the case for 
the future. So maybe last summer you saw it as like pack of cards using it, but now that we're saying it, and also we like we are more years out of the pandemic, like people are actually coming out again. Honestly, next year we might be like, no, let's not do this because it got way too loud. Um, but I think that what we're looking at. I mean, is I don't live. On, I don't live like over there, so I'm not like yeah. coming from a personal, you know. But I try to, you know, just not look at just what's best for me, but what's, yeah. you know, there's there's other that. things that, uh, you know, we're supposed to look at the consensus. But uh, anyway, yeah. in, in this committee, I, I, I'm the way it's 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 screwed. It's I'm gonna be. I think it's bites. Except for you. Can we get tables and chairs for it? Like, if it's going to be an open street, that's up to. Uh, oh, you mean like, like programming and then put like tables and chairs in the street? The way that, you know, because then you don't have to. You could listen to all the jazz from the inside of that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think the Betty, correct me if I'm wrong. Like the open street is really run by the business, right? Like it's not like the city has anything that they can do. Right. So it's like if they want to put it out, they can. Yeah. If they don't, they don't want to have loud music because they have people live about, above, you know. So they just want to have the music's at a low yes. level. And also, that um, okay. Mark Friardi on or whatever is moving in right there, so they might get the you could vote. So I have a feeling this committee is going to say yes. <laughs> maybe maybe we should like. Well, there's no rest. Okay. Yeah. Just an yeah. information. So, yeah. If the public was right. upset. Well, what Zach was saying was that. Usually the partner has to submit a plan for the street and whatnot. Maybe we could get a hold of that plan or talk to them about their plans. I yeah, I would like them to do more. Well, so if they well, maybe you can put it if they if the city is, is or the is requesting any feedback that a couple of people on the committee were for uh, rescinding that street while most while a majority were you know weren't. I mean just to we yeah. tell them that Mitch doesn't like. I mean, we've seen they, if they don't use it, then they could lose it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You have to be familiar. He's, he's I think familiar with that. Encouraging them to do something. It's a quiet. It's a quiet uh, street most of the time. Yeah. In, 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 or it's not like a, a heavily traffic street. It's not a heavily after the pandemic and before the pandemic. It's not a. There was nothing heavy going on before. There's nothing heavy going on now. Right. It just, just certain things. It just it made. It uh, okay. Anyway, so let's move on. Yes. Because I don't even think we're voting on this. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, so since we don't need a vote, but it seems like consensus is, we're not going to make a battle with the DOT to deny this petition. However, if people are interested, it sounds like it. I will try to draft a resolution for next month that would go to Keo asking them to do a little bit more with the street itself. No. <laughs> I, I would I would like you to, to put that with a couple of members that were against it. I mean, how could you? I'm drawing well, up respectful. Then you can vote against yeah, it. Yeah, you can but, vote you against know, it, or you could say that let's make sure we're not going to renew it because we never did anything. Heads of committee supposed to be like you know if you want to advocate for something as much as you want as a as a committee to find, but there should be some type of you know. We just had a discussion. We're not going to write a resolution for the. No, I'm, I'm making a general discussion about. I'm not just about this, but I mean, they, they have so much advocacy from one point of view is it, really not, not you, cool. Let you speak, and we're saying we'll put, we'll discuss a resolution that goes with the majority. You don't write resolutions I, for the minority. I think so. I'm, I'm making a general comment, not specifically. About I think that the committees are are to find a compromise. Right, and so I think a compromise would be use it or lose it. Like, either you do something with the space, or next year you don't get it. I think that that would be a pretty reasonable compromise. Eric has been locked out. Thank you. See, at least you didn't get locked out. It was fine before. It's fine now. Yeah. I mean, it would just. It's not part of the We for the community. We can have a broader. Yeah. Yeah, uh, next community builder. Because it sounds like there's some interest. We want so more. We can yeah. discuss it. Why don't you bring a triple place sometime, okay? Yeah, actually, yeah, I have some time. Well, not now. Later, later. Thank um, you. Okay, ready. Back to you. Okay, next. Ooh. This is also just to get a vague sentiment if you want to continue with this next month, because I have gotten requests to also look at this issue. 
and that is concerns in general about the safety and revitalization of Fulton Center. So I want to kind of see where people are on this particular issue. Pictures that were sent to me, the Fulton Center is in disrepair that's apparent even from the street. Next photo. The art, the broken art installation adds to the neglect that's visible from the street. Kind of a the sad state of affairs. Next. The burned out light bulbs are not being replaced, which is contributing to the dark, unsafe feeling within the center. Much needed escalator remains out of service and has been for a while. Next, they've closed the public bathrooms, so they're unavailable to transit customers, the general public, the homeless, and the deliveristas that frequent the center. Oh. Scaffolding outside, and this is in front of the Corbin building, has been up for five years and shelters a man sleeping outside Fulton Center. Smell of urine in this area shows the bathroom access is needed. This is from a Sun article from last month about the abandoned stores, and there's probably not a whole lot we can do about this. And the center's been open for 10 years, uh, but this is the issue of Westfield, who is also underneath the, the World Trade Center in that mall, uh, plans to pull out of Fulton Center. Uh, it's being reported by the New York City Transit. It appears also that they may be being sued in Westfield to live up to the contract. So we, we don't know what's going to happen with that. But we also know that very recently, just a few days ago, uh, Mayor Adams made a comment about at Fulton Center about a pilot program that's aimed at enhancing subway safety. And it's an initiative that introduces cutting edge technology that's engineered to detect concealed weapons among commuters. Yeah, additionally, and he, this kicked off a 90 day public comment period too. So keep that in mind, uh, which this isn't going to deal with specifically. Uh, additionally, the city plans to allocate resources towards bolstering mental health to support uh, by investing in a team of dedicated clinicians. That was the other part of his announcement. So should we pursue a resolution in, at the May meeting and what issues would you like it to address? More the quality of life, more the safety, more the, where would you like to go? So I'll start. Um, I don't think we should pursue a resolution. I, I think I think the problem here is Westfield. Um, and as Betty said, so Westfield is the one operating it. They're trying to pull out of their lease. Um, there's been some good reporting on what's actually going on here, and they've been telling investors for years that they want to get rid of all their uh, New York properties and become solely European. Um, they've been spreading some in information out there, trying to create a justification that it's about disrepair and it's about safety, but um, they're the ones who are supposed to be keeping it up. They're the ones. They like the landlord, right? Yeah, they're the so, owner. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think. The issue here is them, and the issue is not really having a legitimate operator right now. So I think we should let the litigation play out. They're, the MTA's case is a very strong one. The, the lease is, prohibits them from leaving uh, this early. So um, I think we should let that play out, see what happens, whether they settle it and get a new operator or Westfield continues. But um, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors about the safety issues there and the disrepair. And it's really an issue of Westfield. Well, I think they're both at fault. I mean, I agree with you, but I think there's fault on both sides. So I, I, I agree with you leaving it alone. I agree. Yeah. 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 The, question that I, the question that was posed to me was, with all of the money coming in, well, whatever, from congestion pricing, and there are three different uh, stations in Man Lower Man in our district that are going to be getting some funds to repair them. Should the MTA be asked to please upgrade and use some of those funds to help restore, revitalize? I agree, shopping is needed, but these other signs that you can see even from the outside, the lack of bathrooms, is that acceptable or should we go on record? 
Yeah, um, it's it's a tough one because the operator is Westfield, and I don't know. I mean, we don't know the the, the terms of the contract the lease. Like, though they're in litigation, they're still responsible for maintaining that bathroom. That's my assumption that it's not the TA that that maintains those, those bathrooms. Um, just from looking at it, it's not the typical TA bathrooms that they have, and they normally don't have bathrooms at that usually at terminal stations. But um, it's it's a failed business model. I think it's a failed business model. It was built at the time when things were retail, and now things are online, and there's more competition from other uh, other food places. Um, yeah, this is a tough one. I don't know if we should. It's we have to have them kind of keep their commitment to whatever the contract said. But if they're trying to get out of it, yeah, this is a it's it's also a quality of life issue that maybe is more than transportation related. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't hold off on that. I mean, I, I think that's it's yeah. more quality of life than anything. Yeah. I agree um, with Eric, and in the sense that I also think there could be a rethinking, repurposing of some of the space from retail to something else. I don't know what that is. But no, it's 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 I find it dreary and I, I feel like you know it lost its true um sort of purpose back when the LIR was an LIRR was connected to the Atlantic. That was the talk, you know, back when you know, <laughs> but it just it just it's just uh, you know, maybe repurposing. I think we should be doing. I would imagine that they probably closed the bathrooms because of a safety issue, but then they would need 24 hour security to have proper bathrooms like they have at, you know, Bryant Park or something like that, or in the, the, the new Long Island Railroad Terminal by, by, uh, Brand Central. Central. Yeah, Brand Central yeah. Madison. Which is like a, you know, there's, there's, there's security all, all over there. But I agree with, yeah, I think we're all in agreement, right? That just to let it play out. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find anything though. Like I'm just like desperate for a burger and I like I am all these stairs. Yeah. 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 yeah, but like it's up at the top. It's up at the top. Uh, but it's it's a she's like a fine space. Like the yeah. Shake Shack always has seating. There's a clean bathroom there. Clean, yeah. You know, bathroom there. Uh, at Shake Shack, mm -hmm. and so, but yeah, every like I've been there a bunch of times, and I never know how to get. The, like I always have to look around and try to figure out how to get to Shake Shack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a yeah. weird spot. Malls are dying everywhere, and it's like it's yes, just right. a bad model. Right. Yeah. That's why I, it's I not even that specifically thing. on the question of like yeah. congestion pricing and whether we should ask for money to be spent there. Like I, I wouldn't put more money into a business model that might not be working like I would rather like there it's relatively new like it doesn't need to be restored like yeah. there are subway stations everywhere about the five boroughs that should be restored before this one so how uh, about that the, like uh, the chamber street station mm -hmm. that was just good lord you know, yeah. I mean, not charging runners to run over the Arizona uh, that's not bring that up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to just bring it up as a, as a kind of an aside as a kind of a, 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 a my daughter sent it to me I we I thought it was a, a, a like a, a fake a, a put on and then I, I read it Anyway, continue. Yeah. That's for another day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that and race too. Back to you, Betty. It sounds like we can avoid that one. <laughs> so I thank you all for your input. It does seem very unanimous. So that's a clearly, I will pursue it at this time and see what happens. I will move on to news and updates because so much is going on in transportation. These are quick little bullets. Do you know the MTA gave final approval for congestion pricing in New York City? Uh, it's predicted to start in June, but obviously the lawsuits are still pending and could be an obstacle to the start date. Uh, buses, buses are likely, in fact, they are going to get exemptions, our buses. And just so people get an idea, it's going to include school buses. It's going to include MTA buses. It's going to have actually a lot of the long distance buses. Exemptions will not apply to buses that are not open to the public, such as employee or student shuttles, and it will include buses that do not operate, and it won't include those buses that do not operate on a regular schedule. So that's been finalized. 
Oh, and it also looked like they were going to let city vehicles go. For those who wanted for get also getting exemptions, but of the 30,000 vehicles in the fleet, which is absolutely huge, uh, the mayor's office says that less than half, but probably about half of them, uh, will not qualify for exemptions. <laughs> We just take a second to acknowledge the, the MTA. It took the MTA a while, apparently, to realize that school buses aren't being used as party buses very often. <laughs> <laughs> that was, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> That's just amazing. That's what, why what they weren't originally the recommended. Was the yeah, the party bus theory, the being rented out theory? What is the criteria? So, if there's thirty thousand vehicles in the fleet, and less than half of them will meet the criteria. For exemptions, what is the criteria for exemptions that some of them need? Uh, it appears to be well, the specialized ones make a lot of sense. You know, the snow plows, garbage trucks. I mean, those are the obvious ones. Uh, but then it's supposed to be for those that are on duty or doing city business. But there are also these other fleet that don't exactly do that and they're more for personal use. So evidently, about half of the 30,000 do not qualify for exemption. That's really but all it was said. Is that police cars or is that city? Like, what is what are city vehicles? Does that include police cars and police so like a, vehicles that are blacker parking? DCAS controls all the city owned vehicles. So it should include police. Fire trucks obviously yeah. are specialized and they're going to be included, like plows and. Or like a, like a Department of Buildings car going out to do an inspection or something like that. But if, if it's your. Private vehicle, you're just a public official, a, a cop or a, a teacher, someone who has a placard. Here's what you were asking about. Yeah, yeah. And drives their private car to go to work. That wouldn't be okay. So they will get charged. They no, but, well, they would if, if it's a private vehicle. It's a private vehicle. But I'm talking about city-owned vehicles that would have the logo of the department, whatever on it. Even some of those do not will not qualify under the rules. Meaning they use too often for personal or high level work that's not really city business. Yes, and we I've spoken before about the push for free buses. There is a push now going up to our congressman, uh, our city Manhattan borough president, and the Brooklyn borough president. We're also pushing to expand free and reliable bus service ahead of the launch of congestion pricing. Uh, and that's going through at putting it into the city budget, asking for 90 million uh, to have three new bus free bus routes in addition to the five that already exist. So we'll find that out when the budget gets finalized. Now, for those who want to know about Chambers Street, the MTA will spend 100 million to revitalize two grimy historic New York City stations. And they are pretty horrible. Next one. Both sides are amazing. That. Shows you. All right. Yeah, it's definitely Chambers Street. And it's really hard to believe that this used to be so high level when it was developed with all these decorative elements. And there was no discussion about if they're going to restore or revitalize this with going to that extreme of revitalization. I don't know. Or just unchipped tiles. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's been around since 1904, and it looks like it hasn't been redone much in the interim. But that is one of the ones that is up for being done with congestion pricing fees. Oh, <laughs> Autonomous vehicle testing is going to come to New York City. DOT just released the rules. So companies and people can start applying to do testing with autonomous vehicles. Uh, I want that on my book. I want <laughs> yeah, so this is just giving some of the details about it. Yeah. Really it it's that they're required to have a driver though. Yeah, but like what's the driver gonna right. do? Just like yeah. like gently correct it and hopefully teach it what's what a person is after they hit somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, a lot of the problems now are people standing in the road because so many do that in New York compared to, compared to other cities where it's used more broadly. Ghost car busters. This was the announcement of the 
task force teams with Adams and, and Governor Hochul. But again, I haven't heard any news about them actually doing anything since this. This was posted on March 12th. So this could be just another one of those publicity things and it may not go much further than that. But next, you can see just how many people are working, so-called working together. that are also dealing with all these ghost vehicles, but the MTA, uh, the state, the city, Port Authority, we'll see what happens. So far, nothing. City Council has introduced and reintroduced many proposed laws and resolutions in the last two weeks. This was very interesting because we have to kind of keep an eye out for those that interest you. Uh, some of the key proposal measures require the TLC to establish maximum rates for leasing, not much interest to us, prohibit high volume for higher vehicles from deactivating drivers. Let's see what that goes. The real interesting ones are the last two. It will require one requires the DOT to establish dynamic parking zones with demand based parking fees. There'll be more things that are metered parking and the parking will fluctuate with demand. The other one, the last one prohibits sightseeing. Oh, go back, please. Prohibit sightseeing buses from using bus lanes between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. and then again at rush hour 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. on weekdays. So we'll see what happens with that too. Additional proposed measures do lots of things, uh, but some of the interesting ones are kind of near the bottom. Like battery safety. Oh, some of these are actually resolutions and why? Because they have to ask the state to please pass the laws to do it. So we'll see as these things go out. Next. And resolutions, again, what they plan on asking, because again, the state waits to get the city to formally ask them to do things. So these, it is important to have these resolutions. One would urge the passing of legislation to create a surcharge for funding the expansion of wheelchair accessible and all electric, all higher vehicles. I'll have to see that in the state legislation to see what it actually says. Urge Congress to pass legislation about consumer product safety standards for lithium ion batteries, because that has to be done at the federal level. And they're gonna call on passing of legislation, this would be state, to allow New York City to establish lower speed limits. And this is Sammy's law. It would also cr create crash victims bill of rights. Mm. So we'll see what happens with those. See what happens with these two. This is actually federal courts that are looking at minimum wage delivery drivers must be 100% reimbursed for using their own vehicles. Will this apply to bicycles and things? Unknown, and I'm going to leave this to Jess as this kind of plays out. The next one gives you some of the court cases that lead to this sort of headline. And again, the cases that came to the Supreme Court that came to these various courts uh, are we're really looking at car drivers. So they're pizza delivery people, things going on in the suburbs and other places where it's vehicles. What does that mean? So are they saying that's like reimbursing for gas, reimbursing for maintenance, insurance? And that's part of the question where they disagree uh, because some have used different standards for measurement. One used the IRS mileage rate. Some said it was reasonable to use just the application of, for reimbursement. Those are things going to have to be settled in the big picture, but not all courts have come out with exactly the same measure. So don't know. I put this in for my own personal interest. Whenever there are vehicles that are wheelchair accessible, and this is to get in touch with this last one, they always put in these power lifts that always get broken, and then they need this huge vehicle just for the power lift. These things make so much more sense. I really like them. They just flip down this ramp, and usually this folds in half in the middle, so it, it stands up against the door. But all you have to do then is just 
gently go up and same with strollers and other things can just enter the vehicle and a seats removed to allow you to just pull in. This is so great. Why does New York City do this? Yeah. But there's definitely a contract with Dallas. <laughs> lucky, lucky Brussels. This is part of the signs coming from the Federal Highway Administration of them getting more interested in looking at cyclists and pedestrians and the effect of street changes on them. The original measure as, as of standing now is that it all looks at the movement of vehicles and how efficiently vehicles are being moved. Now they're starting to introduce and who gets hurt or excluded in the process. So it'll be interesting to follow this uh, rule change that was published, see what happens. Next, because this would control some of what the DOT can do. And then as in blue highways, they mentioned about the wider cargo, the bigger cargo bikes, the new rule. That, remember we spoke about a while, months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually, and I was wondering, because I didn't hear anything about it, that's because they did some major rewriting, did the DOT, and it was just announced this week. They've finalized it. If you go to the next, you can get some of the details of what they've changed, and they changed a lot in it. And this is what they originally showed as their vision of the 48 inch wide and for height. But next one gives you some of the details of what they changed. Yeah, it was announced on March 27th. It was, it, was, it was last Wednesday, a week ago. And now bicycle includes pedal assist bicycle. So again, this is part of the problem that for people who are talking about, why don't they put all these legislations about licenses and other things? By New York state law, these will be considered bicycles, will pedal assist, not vehicles or not motor vehicles. Yes. Sounds wildly dangerous because they're going to be super heavy, go 20 miles an hour. And look well, no, they, no, 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 no. Don't make any assumptions. A lot of changes occurred. Uh, they have okay, defined... Did you see that guy just sitting in that box? He didn't have a seatbelt. Does he have like an airbag? Like, yeah, but that's the comes? original rule. This, this is the new, this is the final rule. Go on. The rule established new curb regulations, so there will be commercial bikes, like little loading zones. For them to pull into. Uh, they also will. They can be 48 inches. I think the next one has more details. Try the next slide. Yeah, to address these are the concerns, because there were a lot of comments made about this. They've dropped it from 20 miles per hour to 15 miles per hour maximum speed for these commercial uh, cargo bikes and call them commercial. To address concerns about pedestrian access, cargo bikes cannot be parked or left unattended on the sidewalk for any reason. This is a change from the proposed rule where you could go on the sidewalk. Uh, to encourage proper loading, uh, they have to comply with manufacturers' weight rating specifications. They're putting that requirement on so you can't overload something. And in fact, the driver of the vehicle, of the bicycle cargo bike is responsible for making sure their vehicle is not overloaded. They also encourage you to encourage the adoption of it. They have made some changes about the maximum length and height. Uh, they've expanded the dimensions. Again, the, the original proposed rule would have excluded the cargo bikes used by Whole Foods. So by adding the whole trailer dimension, they have made the, it a little bit longer, it can go a little bit taller, but these are to go with what's off the rack available, making things cheaper for vendor, for commercial businesses to get their own or to hire a commercial bike delivery system to use. And it's in effect on April the 26th. Uh, the number of communities using automated speed cameras uh, are having continued to climb. And if you go to the next, these are mostly some general information, but I think the last one has some New York City statistics. Because again, this is still national to show that it really does reduce the percentage of speeding vehicles and is found in New York City. 
people tend not to do it again, at least not in the same location. So it's not just a money grab, it really is to change behavior and over 80% do change their behavior and don't get ticketed a second time. In fact, if you look at the bottom of this, New York City has over 2,000 speed enforcement cameras. They're only in school zones. Again, that's going to probably change. Uh, it experienced a 73% decrease in speeding where there's a fixed camera. So New York City data shows that it does change behaviors and reduce speeding. Next. Ah, everybody's doing reports now. The Citizens Budget Commission, which is an independent civic organization, did a survey and this particular item, they were looking at, uh, looking at in your neighborhood, how do you view bike safety? And this is done by borough. And if you look Manhattan, the most gloomy about bike safety in Manhattan, and it's a good percent who find it unsafe or very unsafe. So it is time well spent for us to look at bicycle safety. Next. If you look at it in terms of income. And I look, this is only this is citywide, but if you look at it, income really is not much of a deciding factor, which I found kind of interesting. They all view safety the same way, how safe things were, or weren't to kind of judge the same. Next, and this is looking at pedestrian safety. Otherwise, it's the same and then it's looking at citywide. And again, a little bit viewed a little bit safer than bicycle, but nevertheless, a very large percent saw problems with safety for pedestrians. Also worthy of us putting more time into it. Next. Straightening out information about who's responsible for these various heliport and these air taxis, which are the e votals And the state, local, and tribal governments. So New York City would be responsible for the Berta Port zoning and the permitting, which is what they're doing on Pier 6. But the legal authority about can these vehicles fly or not is the FAA. And they are predicted to be but the voting on this next year. So we'll see. Dubai has already legalized them, so they are flying there on commercial, regular commercial routes. Have to go back to the water, and this is about the 250th birthday of the United States in 2026. There's going to be another massive ship parade, and it's going to be down by our district. So next, so you can see what happened. In, in 1976, which was the 250th birthday. I'm sorry, this was the 200th birthday. Uh, some of the pictures from that. And next, this is the group that will be operating this whole initiative. So you should be hearing and seeing more from them as time gets closer. And I need some more information for you in July, because they're starting, they want to formalize the calendar for CB1 in July. We would be meeting on July 3rd. So obviously they want us to move in July. So I'm, I will send out an email, but I want you to start thinking about it. And all of you will be honest, you can hear what other people say too. We will either, every single night is booked because the 23rd of July is when there's full board. The first week is thrown out because of July 4th. And the last week is thrown out because it's after the CB1 monthly meeting. We're left with two tightly packed weeks of meetings every night. So it may come down to us to decide who do we wanna double up with and do you want earlier or later if we can find a committee that's willing to split. And Zach has to let us know what days he would be available to be with the meeting. So that would kind of kick off this round of information, but they're looking for us to come to a decision and I want to find out from people what would work for them. So expect an email and I'll hopefully have Zach's information to put in that email. So thank you for answering when you get it. And 
<laughs> I'm going to adjourn unless somebody says otherwise, but put up with our April showers next month, maybe better. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you guys saw the Department of Investigation had a uh, released their report on placard abuse today. Oh, I saw that. They needed to hire to investigate. <laughs> I could have, we could have saved them a lot of money. <laughs> We didn't have a QR code, right? Uh, yeah. it's, it's always live. Yeah, it's on the door. I see. Uh, Thank you, buddy. But it's also always.